I'm here with Alex Serrano uh, at uh, Security Edge here in Melbourne. And Alex is the leader at Mercer Pacific, uh, Mercer Pacific Information Security Division at Marsh McLennan. How are you, Alex? I'm well, thanks, Byron. Tell us a little bit about your role. Tell us a little bit about Mercer Pacific and how it fits into Marsh McLennan. Um, Mercer Pacific uh, is a financial service organisation yep. uh, that is committed to uh, invest, investing and looking after Australians and New Zealanders' uh, superannuation funds. Yep. Uh, we do fund administration. Yep. Uh, we also invest uh, those funds uh, for the benefit of, of members and organisations, entities. And we also do a range of other services around the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, remuneration and other consulting. So you're um, a, my role, sorry. You're essentially the CISO for Mercer Pacific. Yeah, I'm right? the CISO, the, essentially the, the CISO for, I'm the leader for information security for Pacific, I, yeah. and I work with the global chief security officer for Mercer. How big's your team there, your cyber team? We've got a team of about 20 people globally, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I work with and leverage every day to deliver those capabilities. And um, at a global level, we're something like 150. Okay, so if quite significant. Take, yeah, if you take into account the whole of Marsh McLennan, because we, we're a very integrated security team. We mm -hmm. uh, Part of Mercer is we, we essentially work with the larger global security group, and we integrate it across all of Marsh McLennan brands. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about, Alex, a little bit about the threats that you're facing at the moment, particularly in the wake of the big attacks that we've seen here in Australia over the past 12 months. What have you learned from these attacks and how, I guess, is, how has this informed your cyber posture? Has it had an impact? It has had an impact. I'd say the, the main impact is uh, to understand that uh, Australia is now much more of a target. Australia, mm. New Zealand, much mm. more of a target towards opportunistic and uh, focus cyber attacks than ever before. Mm. Well, the events of the last sort of 12 to 18 months, we've seen that ramp up. Mm. I think last year we saw that Australia for the first time around October, November became the most, essentially the most attacked Indeed. nation on earth. And the government responded too. Government responded. Yeah. Um, we've seen uh, some actual changes to the Privacy Act and sure. to the, the, the capabilities fines. of the OAIC, the fines, mm. which have gone up to 50 million, depending on uh, proven, you know, mm. breach in, in response. So that's put directors on notice, uh, put organisations on notice. Mm. Um, and it's also increased the awareness and sensitivity of our members mm. and our customers as, uh, as to the criticality of their data mm. and the need for it to be protected. And that's tr often translated through our, our client organisations, part of the Mercer Super Trust and others, mm. who just want to have additional confidence and comfort that their information is being protected. Mm -hmm. So that's impacted my role in a large way because when those events that are external to our organisation happen, I need to be able to ensure that um, are we protected and ready for those things internally in our organisation? Absolutely. And then if we're not, uh, or if there are areas for improvement that we make them. In every case, we've shown that we have the right controls. Mm. Um, but you always learn something and you can mm. always improve the security posture. So I just see... The main change is the cadence mm. of having to respond to new threats and new demands for improved security controls mm. to meet the needs of regulators, customers and individual members. Absolutely. So a conversation that I have quite often with CISOs is how they articulate the value of cybersecurity to the CEO, to the boards, uh, yes. to the rest of the C-suite. Right. Uh, I guess it's been a little bit easier in recent times to do that and to get the budget that you need for cyber because they now realise that they're on the hook. They are. If something goes wrong, right? We all are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so how do you go about articulating the value of cyber to your, to your board, to your um, CEO? What sort of strategies do you use? Yeah, that's a great question. There are really, it's carrot and stick, essentially. Mm. I'd preface my response by saying that I very rarely have to do that. Mm. Um, my role was the first of its kind when I uh, joined in mm. July 2021. Um, there wasn't a leader of security for Mercer in region, but because of the regulatory changes, the increased uh, expectations of our boards, mm. we have um, audit and risk committees and boards that face off against each of our businesses within Mercer. And as part of that, there was just a general expectation that security is one of uh, the areas that we're handling well. Uh, so it, it's not it's not normally a challenge for me to uh, communicate the need, but where I do in specific circumstances or to get an additional budget mm. for improvements, mm. um, there's the, the stick, which is, look, the privacy uh, penalties for an uh, egregious privacy breach have just gone up from mm. 
something in the order of four million to fifty to million. Fifty, yeah, it's, it's going to hurt shot. you. It's a yeah, huge jump. Sure. Now it hasn't been used, but like, do you want to play that game of Russian roulette? No. Mm. Um, on the positive side, which I prefer, uh, the carrot is that um, it makes a massive difference uh, to business growth if you are able to demonstrate that you are security accredited or that mm. you have strong security controls. Mm. And I've seen both at both ends. I've seen organizations trying to sell services and capabilities to Mercer mm -hmm. or Mercer trying to sell service and capabilities to other external organizations, entities and customers. Mm. The ability to demonstrate that you've got profound, strong and leading edge security controls gives you an advantage in the market. You win new business, you, you find it easier to retain existing business mm. and we all know what it, how much it costs when you're trying to win back customers you've lost perhaps because of a cyber breach yep. or even just the perception that you're yep. not strong on cyber. Absolutely. And, and, and Medibank and Optus have had to try and win back customer trust as well, haven't they? A lot Since of organisations have. Yeah. Um, and a lot more will. Mm. And there's no guarantees that you won't be hit by a cyber event. Mm. Um, you will be. It's not a matter of when. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's when, right? They often say that. that. They often say that. It's, it's, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't entirely agree okay. um, because I think if we, if you take that logic to the ultimate extent, yep. then a little bit of fatalism can kick in. Say, yep. okay, well, we're, we're guaranteed to be breached. Yep. I think it's, I prefer to say, um, while I don't totally disagree with that, and I've, mm. I've probably used that before. Yourself, yeah. Um, I prefer to say, uh, even if you do all the right things to protect your organization, protect your endpoints, protect your users, uh, if the attacker is committed enough, um, you may still suffer a data incident. Mm. So there's no guarantee, regardless of the controls you put in place, that you won't experience a bad day in cyber. Sure. How you respond to that is the, important is the really important bit. Uh, and that's we people talk about resilience, cyber resiliency, that's why the NIST framework has the whole stage of preparing, protecting, identifying your assets, but also the capability to respond and recover. Mm. And what we've seen uh, without naming names is the organizations that are well drilled in that respond and recover can come through cyber events without having material loss to their business or their mission. Um, and other organizations that seem to have been caught a little bit as a deer in the headlights of have not handled it well, and occasionally they go out of business. Mm, absolutely. But, um, it, 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 it depends. Mm. Just on trust, how have you gone about building credibility and trust uh, across your organization, and, and specifically digital trust as well, because that's important, right? Yeah. So within the organization, the cybersecurity function is critical mm. to protecting the data, the integrity, the availability, and the confidentiality of customer and, and corporate information, corporate confidential information. We handle a lot of sensitive personal information of our members, mm. uh, as you'd expect any superannuation administrator or superannuation fund and investment business to do. Um, the way that I like to build credibility of the security function is to not be seen as the department of no. So mm. it, you really need to be, um, seen to be very open to whatever the business or the technology team that's coming to you is trying to do because very rarely will they be able to come to you with a project or a technology change that won't require you to think creatively about how you apply policies mm. and how you implement security mm. uh, and that's where instead of just the knee-jerk reaction of traditional security to say you can't do that you, ca you can't be that anymore you have to say well this might be a challenge. What are your compensatory controls? What can we do to make that safer? Because you, you can never have perfect security. Sure. You can never have every security control. No. Um, for a bunch of reasons, from budget through to simple practicalities. Sure. Some controls automatically compete with each other. Mm. What you want to do is have enough control over the security arrangement so that the risk appetite of your organization which is not even set by me, it's set by the business leadership, it's set by the board, it's set by the execs, um, the CEO and, and CFO. And then we match work to that risk appetite. Hmm. You've got to embrace some risk to get growth within the business. Hmm. Uh, and then the other thing we do is we act with some humility. Hmm. So 
it's been said that I think about 100 years ago was, or 120 years ago was the last time that any one person could be said to be a polymath and have good knowledge about every knowledge domain available. The information age has destroyed that. It's destroyed it. Destroyed yeah. it. Nobody knows it. And that's scary subject. because then we all walk around with a feeling of um, Im imposter syndrome because no matter how long, I've been in security for 20 years, but there's lots that I don't know. Mm. And even if I had a security team of 50 people, where even we are then depending on some of the technologists in a team who are not technically security people mm. to inform us about what's possible mm. from a security perspective. Mm. So that openness and humility to have a real conversation with technology and the business, mm. um, because there's no one security control technology feature business process that will secure the information, it's always a combination. Mm. Uh, so that goes a long way because mm. then the technology team, there's less of a chance you get caught in the a very nasty um, dynamic of mm. us and them or mm. they think they know everything. Mm. Um, and then the last thing I would say is to work at the speed of the business. Mm. So that's the big challenge. When you're digesting all this information, there's always an asymmetry between mm. the demand, the, those that are demanding the help of security, mm. the project teams, technology, and the number of security people there are facing off against them. So uh, there's always more, there's always very few security people. It doesn't matter which business you're in. It's very easy to become a bottleneck. Sure. And if you're trying to do your job well and you're trying to sift through data and not just give a, a rubber stamp or a green tick to everything without thinking about it, suddenly an assessment of one day becomes two days, an assessment mm. of three days becomes a week. Mm. You're no longer operating at the speed of business where decisions need to be made quickly. Mm. So what, we, what I've tried to do is demonstrate that I never, uh, representing the security function, any delays on a project or an initiative or a go-to-market, you can, I, I take as a bit of a badge of honor that you can yeah, never sure. put that at the foot of security. Sure. There's, there may be other reasons, but yeah. it's not, a, and if it is us, you've got to tell me straight away because mm. we'll, we'll fix it. Alex, do you think that organisations and even competitors should be working together on the cyber front, like a strength in numbers type thing or, or not? Because I find that CISOs are talking more and more about what's going on inside their businesses and how they've overcome various issues. Do you think there needs to be more of a cooperative approach to this? What's your view? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, and I've been part of some of those bodies when I worked within the banking industry. This yep. banking has these information sharing entities and bodies. Um, they're good and Chatham House rules apply. But again, as an ex-banker, um, I've been drilled to be very careful with the sorts of things I disclose, even sure. in public forums. And it's not because you, you, you've got a room of 100 people and I'm protecting the information of thousands of clients of Mercer. Sure. There's, uh, there's limits to what you can share. So the answer is we, d we should and we do share information about breaches and events. FS Isaac is an entity that, that does a sure. good job of sharing those sorts of things. Uh, at a one-to-one -one level, it works really well if I can let a bit of cat out of the bag. Um, but I'm a little cautious about this panacea of um, um, broad scale knowledge sharing yep. um, because anything you're putting out there which is of real value, uh, tactics and techniques, the TTPs, um, guess what? The cyber attackers are on the lookout for that information I'm too. Sure. Yeah. And that's the, that's the dynamic that I think you need some good judgment about, even when you're talking to vendors. Mm -hmm. you've, got to, you've got to give to get, uh, but it's within the bounds of what's reasonable and sure. having to understand what, what you can. What I do think is important from interoperability, what I'd like to see more of, uh, especially in the light of the events of the last 12 months, because we, sure. are, I think, believe we're at a tipping point for a security in Australia. Oh, from without a, a doubt. Yeah. Now, I think what I've been calling for personally um, in my conversations with people and at these sorts of uh, different sort of events is the need for uh, a better, more centralised uh, form of digital identity management. So I was very pleased to see the government is, is sort of pushing forward with its bill on identity management and identity management, digital identity system. Yeah, we've got Victor Nominello speaking this afternoon about 
And one, he's, yes, he's been one yes. person who's really driven that, I, and I, I interviewed him a few months I ago. I love what he's been doing, and yep. I follow him quite closely. Yep. And he's been pioneering that with Services New South Wales and, um, and other things he's done since. Mm. Um, and to me, it's very obvious because the, and, and the, if it were not for the events that we had last year, um, I don't think we'd push to this edge mm. where we need to stop a situation where so many entities like Mercer and others banks, credit institutions, telecommunication businesses, other all have to collect the same set of identification, the, the so-called 100-point check or 10-point check to verify that, you know, Byron, you are who you are, Alex, I am who I am. Who I am. Um, it's inefficient, it's costly, uh, it, it, it makes businesses prone to, to the breaches when they occur, if they occur are worse than they should be. And I like what's being put forward yeah, because I don't think government can do it all from a, uh, and I don't think business can do it without regulation and standardization. Yeah. It needs to be voluntary, yeah. but by making this standard available and, and putting forward a group of accredited providers of these digital services whose core business is to provide for that digital identity verification, yeah. a lot of the say $3.5 billion worth of um, loss, cyber related, fraud loss that Australians are experiencing as, as we understand it mm. just last year alone, mm. that can start to get reduced mm. um, because we just can't have these big breaches where personal information, names, addresses, TFNs yeah, I, are getting splashed I out I absolutely there. agree. Something's uh, got to change. But the main thing is, um, and uh, the main thing I, I don't want to get things to get lost in this discussion about mm. interoperability and information sharing Sure. Is, and I think it's, it's getting a little bit lost, is the, mm. is the importance of centrality of privacy protection. Mm. Because uh, we saw what happened when they tried to introduce the Australia card back in 1985. Mm. Mm. Uh, we tried the access card in the early 2000s, mm. similar variation of the same thing. Mm. It had so much generic pushback and some of it was quite valid. Mm. I don't want the digital identity um, for Australians to be the same, essentially, you don't want the same thing to happen. The same thing to happen, yeah, and it doesn't need to. No, but people won't um, won't accept the process and all the benefits that come to it if they feel that their privacy is being is being eroded. eroded. And so I think there are ways to, to fix that. But yes, certainly, we're not there yet. Alex, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. It's been a great discussion, and thank I you, hope Byron. you enjoy the rest of Security Edge. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.